Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Gaylord National Harbor Convention Center where we're covering the Air Force Association's annual Air, Space and Cyber Conference and Trade Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And we're honored to have with us General uh, Mike Mobile uh, Holmes, who is the uh, commander of the United States Air Force's Air Combat Command, the man who's in charge of all the combat air forces. Sir, thanks very much for taking time with us. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Um, I, I, I I appreciate that. I want to. I want to start, sir. You know, to get your vision. Uh, you've spent a little bit of time now in the job to understand where you see uh, air power as you look out five, ten, fifteen years. China very quickly moving to uh, adapt a vast array of technologies. The Russians are demonstrating their capability both in anti-access area denial, but also in uh, projection. Would like to get a sense from you. Uh, you know, General Harigian is rubbing up against that. Uh, General Walters is rubbing against it, and obviously uh, General O'Shaughnessy in the Pacific is rubbing against the Chinese. Talk to us a little bit about what your vision is. What do you see as the future of air power and how to keep the United States in the lead? So I think the future of air power is integrating all the tools that the Air Force brings together and being able to do that really fast. We want to be able to operate at a tempo that's high enough that our adversaries have to react to us. And you know we can talk about that in some detail on the whys that, that go behind that. But ultimately, our nation has lived for the last 25 years really on the investment that we made in the Reagan era in what OSD would call the TAC Air portfolio. Not just the Air Force, but the Navy and the Marine Corps and all those resources. It brought us the F-15, the F-16, the F-18, uh, eventually the F-22, the A-10, uh, and now we're working toward the F-35. To get that advantage, we had to invest extra for about 10 years on top of the defense budget. It's been given flexibility and freedom of action to the whole joint force. And at ACC, we want to make sure that we make the investments now to have another 25 years of, of dominating the air that the joint force can depend on. And that uh, was the second offset strategy. It was born out of our experiences in Vietnam. Um, F-117 went into service in 1981. Um, there was a huge investment also in space-based assets, GPS, comms, precision uh, strike. Um, how does the game change when the adversaries have that capability? I mean, there are some folks who are saying that if you look at stealth, it may expire. That edge may be expired by 2025 at, at the max, especially as new generations of EOIR sensors come out. How do you guys stay ahead of this game in a world that, you know, again, the third offset is about, you know, addressing that technological gap and keeping the U.S. in the lead. What are, what are some specific things that you see out there um, how you think about fighting this kind of a different yeah, adversary. So there's a lot there, a lot of questions. There is, there is. That was a little bit of the why I was trying to get to. I'll see if I can get back into it. But if you look at the modern battlefield and the things you talked about, so long range precision fires have become ubiquitous among people with big, strong modern militaries. Uh, the intel, exquisite intel that we have had an advantage with now is spreading to nations that are building their own ability to do that the ability to use social network to go find information and pull that out, plus the industry-driven space constellations that are going to provide pretty good imagery, pretty good radar coverage, and maybe even global communications, you know, with the Wi-Fi net from space. That means everybody is going to have access to that in some way. So instead of spending all our time trying to find out exquisite information about the enemy, We'll still have to spend some time doing that, but from multiple sources, we're going to be trying to make the enemy doubt the validity of their information because the battlefield is moving to a place where, because of that, there are no boundaries on the battlefield anymore. Those precision long-range fires can reach anywhere across the breadth and depth of the battlefield. There's no hiding places. You can't you know, hide behind the weather. You can't hide by being at a distance, and there's no sanctuary. So to be able to come in and do things like we did in Desert Storm where we had ports that were uh, safe and invulnerable, we could take plenty of time and build logistics. Because of those three things, the Joint Force is going to have to figure out how to, I think, operate at a tempo, how to confuse the enemy about what they're able to believe and in their information, and drive them into a reactive posture as we, as we go forward. So Air Power's part in that is that we're going to have to work uh, to be able to spread our tools across multi-domains. We're going to continue to do the conventional things we've done. And stealth may not be uh, sufficient all on its own, but it'll be required. It'll still be the entry to get into some of those areas. And then, yeah, you're probably going to have to bring other tools to, to help you go do it. You're going to want to be integrated with all your information gathering and get that information out to people on the front edge because you won't have time 
to do boards and kind of committee decisions like we've done in joint warfare, where we had the advantage of driving everything, having a big advantage. You could have a joint targeting board and pick three days targets from now. Those targets won't be there maybe three hours from now. And so you're going to have to figure out how to act faster. Um, and how are you guys doing that? I mean, um, I remember your predecessor and your predecessor's predecessor started, for example, doing exercises where systems were denied. There was a lot of very active jamming. You have forces now deployed around the world that are actively being jammed, whether they're U-2s or reconnaissance aircraft, uh, notably off the Korean peninsula, because the Koreans have gotten very good at that. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But what are some of the things that you guys are doing by way of exercises, uh, and also even at the general officer level of how to speed decision making? Are you guys practicing that at a level to get that kind of agility given how fast some of the future battle space is going to move. So, you know, you may have heard me talk about there is a challenge because the kind of war we've been fighting for the last 15 years has been very deliberative. We wanted to go slow. We wanted to make sure that we didn't create uh, anything unnecessary, and we were willing to accept some risk on the military force in order to move forward deliberately and make sure that we did everything in our power to safeguard innocent civilians, you know, in the areas where our adversaries chose to fight. If you think about fighting against a peer adversary, you know, there's some benefit to the civilians that are caught on the battlefield and winning fast. The longer you fight, the worse it's going to be for everybody. So we want to kind of recreate that uh, initiative for our guys. Part of it is giving them information and getting it out to them so that they have the right tools to be able to decide. Part of it is training in what we'd call contested, degraded, operationally limited environments, which you talked about, and we do that in all our exercises. And then at the general officer level, we've done some things like uh, we have a repetitive series of war games where we try to bring in our one and two star up and coming, you know, our future superstars and let them come back periodically and game through a scenario. So they'll game it, uh, they'll work through with the team, we'll come back and a year later we bring in two thirds of the same people and introduce one third new and they come back and do a similar scenario again and see what they learn and see how they thought and see how they get better and to try to build the reps that it takes to learn to think faster and, and work in this new domain. Um, what are the things that you don't have? For example, U-2s are now being refitted with star sites uh, in order to be able to do navigation the good old-fashioned way to make sure that uh, they're not the, uh, the trigger for an international incident. Um, what are the things you don't have? For example, electronic warfare is repeatedly said as something the Air Force has a shortcoming. Obviously, EF-111 went away, the EA-6B became that platform, Navy has invested in it, Marines talk a lot about it. You don't hear as much coming out of the Air Force. What are some of the things that you need, whether it's EW, you know, what, what do you have, but what do you really need to start investing in? So I'm going to be a little cagey here. I'm going to take some of my cue from Admiral Richardson, you know, the CNO. I've heard him say a couple of times, hey, I'm fighting against some smart, tough adversaries, and I don't really want to tell them uh, everything that we need and everything that we're doing. But I think you're right uh, in the overall picture. So we've been able to live on just having a quantitative advantage that meant we didn't have to pay as much attention to integrating all those tools together. When we go back and square off against a peer adversary, smart, tough people that have been watching us for 25 years and trying to build things to go after our strengths or go after our weaknesses, now we have to go back and rethink the things that we had to do before to integrate electronic combat, uh, maybe cyber tools, maybe information tools in with kinetic uh, attacks and be able to go in and put the whole thing together where do you practice that? You know, we'll practice some of that live out on ranges. We'll practice some of that in our virtual environment because we don't really want everybody to know what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Um, I, I, I respect that answer, and I'll, I'll, I'll still, keep, uh, still keep asking over, uh, the question over time. Let's go to readiness. So that's a very big challenge. You've spoken about it. Air Force leadership has. It's nothing new. I'm, I'm getting a repetitive question disorder by asking yep. every single military leader over the last seven, uh, eight years about that. Um, what are some of the things, uh, do you have to reconcile yourself? The U.S. Air Force has always prided itself on having a ready force that's across the board. But in reality, we have gotten into a somewhat tiered readiness model. Is it time to embrace a tiered readiness model and say, look, here are the ready to fight units. We're, they're going to get a little bit more of the investment dollars. Here are the secondary units. We're going to take some risk over there, given that there are such funding limitations that you guys face on a daily so basis. So this is a discussion you know, we've had multiple times over the last couple of years with our, with our masters in OSD and in Congress. And look, the short version I would tell you is that a tiered readiness model makes a lot of sense for, say, the Navy where their aviation is tied to the shipyard schedules of an aircraft carrier and the battle group. And so they know when they come back from a deployment, 
that there'll be shipyard things that have to be done. The air wing won't be available until the ship is available, and so it makes sense to do more tiered readiness. The issue for us is that the war plans require us to have almost all of our force there in a very short amount of time. So we resist tiered readiness. It doesn't mean it's not a reality in some conditions because of the constant rotation that we're on, but we try to do things differently. So instead of taking all our airplanes through depot at the end of a deployment, kind of equivalent to that shipyard schedule, we spread them out over the course of a year. And so you always have one or two of your aircraft in depot, and so you always have enough to go do your job. What we're trying to do to make time to get back to that is that when our guys are home, we talk about a deploy to dwell. We want them to have you know, five periods at home for every one period they're gone. Uh, we can live with four periods at home for every one period they're gone. So if they're gone for six months, they'd get four times that or two years at home to rebuild their readiness for those tougher, contested, degraded environment scenarios. What's also important is what you do while you're home because part of what we're doing when we're home is training in the building blocks and training our maintainers to be able to generate more sorties and take better care of the airplanes. And we're flush right now with brand new maintainers as we've added in strength. So we call them three levels, uh, apprentices, and then we want to train them up to five level and then up to seven level. And the way you do that is at home. You have time for the seven levels to spend time with the three levels and teach them their skills and sign them off on the next part. So we think we have an obligation to avoid tiered readiness. Uh, we think we need to be ready to go with almost the whole Air Force in a very short amount of time because we're so small. And that's why we resist the idea. Um, you, uh, you invoke the Navy, so let me take a Navy example. Navy is doing a lot of soul searching now about why um, it had four uh, ship accidents, two deadly collisions out in the Pacific. One of the conclusions that, that some of the graybeards have is that when once upon a time sailors spent a lot of time underway driving their ships and fighting their ships, now there are a lot of other duties. Folks are maybe not as prepared. They're having a lot of time in joint billets. Uh, and even sea tours are not really full sea tours. From an Air Force perspective, do you have a concern that after 15 or now actually more, 27 years, depending on how you can calculate it, the air, and, and with jointness, airmen are not spending as much time on their core skills. Are you confident as somebody who cut uh, his teeth uh, you know, much, much earlier in, in the Cold War, in fact, as an F-15 driver, that your force has the core skills, especially after uh, so many years of, of tight budgets? So there's work to be done there. You know, the Air Force I grew up in, we had SAC and TAC, and they came together as ACC, and now they, you know, we're separated back out again to some extent between air combat and global strike command. But on the water tower in TAC, it said readiness is our profession. On the water tower in SAC, it said peace is our profession. And they both kind of meant the same thing. It meant our job is to be ready every day to prevent war or go fight and win it. So as we look at our Air Force, we don't have just young maintainers. We also have a young crew force because of our uh, shortages. And so we're cranking more people through our training programs. So we're bringing people in with low experience. And we have to be careful that we don't just focus all our efforts on that high-end combat training skill. We also have to do the basic building blocks of taking off and landing and flying formation. One of my commanders calls that doing ordinary things exceptionally well. And I think that's what we want to get after, is to make sure that first we build those building blocks of our young crews and our young maintainers being able to do those ordinary things exceptionally well every day. And if we can do that, then we'll build a base that we can add on the more exquisite skills. Um, that's right, because those guys are the ones who are going to be teaching future generations. So if their skills are rusty, uh, that's, not, that's not a good picture. You talked about the pilot shortage. Um, the Air Force has thrown a lot of money at, at this problem, but it's apparent that uh, folks like you want to get out there and fly, that it's not necessarily a money thing. Um, they complain about having uh, you know, all the other duties that come with being an officer in the United States Air Force. Um, I think that if you went back to 19, <laughs> the earliest days of the Air Service, uh, I'm sure Hap Arnold would have been complaining yep. he's not doing enough flying. It's part of the job. Do you have to consider a warrant officer structure like the, the Army has, where basically folks just spend a lot of time flying and, and there are two career tracks ultimately? So, you know, we have to balance that. Um, you know, that's something that you could talk about, but the one of the things that's different, and I try to explain a little bit of this, is so what one of the things that's different about the Air Force and our air crews is that we also maintain the theater air operation centers that bring joint air power together for the COCOMs. And we have to have enough people extra 
beyond the people that man our squadrons to be able to do that and do it well. So we have to keep enough crews for 55 fighter squadrons and 25 persistent attack and reconnaissance, you know, RPA squadrons and my RSR crews and everything else. But what I really need are the experienced ones. So we've defined that in the past as 500 hours. So a fighter squadron can generate something like five of those a year and the way the experience ratio works. You take in about five new people, and three years later you kick out five experienced people that now can form the basis of other squadrons, but can also go to that Air Operations Center and be a subject matter expert. Hey, this is how we want to employ the F-15 when we write tomorrow's air tasking order. This is the right way to do it. And then serve on the, the management headquarters staffs to make good decisions about what we're going to do in the future, and then again at the headquarters staff. So i got to make sure I generate enough of the people that can do that. So when you look at fly only track and working through those, you know, I'm willing to talk about anything, but I have to make sure that I meet the institutional requirements that'll build an Air Force of the future. You know, I'm really excited about our 18XX career field, which are our RPA pilots. So they're reaching the end, some of them are reaching the end of their kind of five years in operational units and are now gonna be available to come into the Air Operations Centers and into the staff. I look forward to having them there. I'm gonna treat my staff positions the same. I need their combat experience and I want them to get the development that'll prepare them to be Air Force senior leaders in the future by coming into that Air Operations Center and that planning environment to go forward. So we're building pilots and we're gonna build more every year. We pushed up our total this year, we'll push it up next year. We're working hard to try to convince guys to stay. You know, you talked about it. I think our crews, they want to master the skill set that not everybody can do. You know, that's part of what uh, empowers people to do this job is it's not easy and to be able to do it and do it well means I've got to give them some resources, I've got to give them some time, and they take pride in that. I also think they want some autonomy, you know, to be able to pursue that and, and to be able to take care of their families as they do it. And we're working all those things, but ultimately they want to be good and what they do, and it's my job to give them the tools, what we'd call kind of quality of service, to make sure that they can do the training they need to do to be competent in the airplane so that they feel confident they can do the job that America depends on them to do. Um, that was a great segue to my uh, equipment question about, uh, speaking of tools, um, you have been one of the intellectual fathers of the OAX uh, approach, the light strike aircraft. From your standpoint, with a much smaller force, it's better to have counterinsurgency duties done by things that are not high-end combat aircraft that can be, you can take a little bit more risk on them. And in a press conference, yesterday, you suggested that ISR, and Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, may be another piece uh, of, of that puzzle. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you can expand this so that F-35 may not necessarily be the right tool to be flying over Afghanistan and doing some of these duties. Can you extend this to strike? Do you need, for example, a $5 million very long-range strike asset that's totally expendable, that you can send one way in order to be able to execute some high-threat missions? Talk to us a little bit about how this idea can be fleshed out. And what are the perils of it? Because if I was a lawmaker who just wants to say, hey, we gave the Air Force a lot of airplanes, I can take that money, you don't get F-35s, but yep. you get a whole lot of propeller-driven airplanes that yep. may be limited against Russia. Yeah, and so that's a, hard, that's a hard line to walk and work through it. I mean, it comes down to how long do you think the current conflict against violent extremist organizations is gonna last. So we started off thinking there'd be a time limit. You know, we'd go and we'd finish it up. And so it made sense to use what you had and work through that. They may be overqualified and overexpensed, you know, for the job that you're gonna do, but you had them and it made sense to use it. If you view it as our chief does, as a generational struggle, and maybe we're halfway through it, then we need to think about would it be better for our country? Would it be cheaper? to have a lower cost, more efficient way to continue to, con to, continue to conduct this long struggle. Uh, and so that's what we want to experiment with. And so we did our experiment at Holloman and we kind of wanted to say, hey, is there some portion of what we're doing every day in the Middle East that could be done by a less expensive light attack airplane? And if so, are there available airplanes off the shelf that we could skip a two year requirement writing process and skip you know, two years of building an acquisition strategy and working requirements and mods. Is there something that we could go to now that would be available, that would be cheaper to acquire, but really more than that, cheaper to operate? So if you look at the operating costs of the fifth gen capability that we need to deter war against a high-end peer adversary, we don't want to pay that much in cost per flying hour 
to uh, do something that you can do with a less capable asset. So we looked at those airplanes in a high hot environment at Holloman. The next step will be uh, to go see how they do in the combat environment and see how we think about some of the things we talked yesterday. So if I'm going to use a low cost light attack airplane, do I still want to fly a high cost exquisite ISR asset that was made to bring back results? you know, to let you target a peer adversary or to operate in a more contested domain? Or are there cheaper things I could do as well? When I'm going to communicate with a, a coalition ground force, do I really want them to have to go try to acquire exquisite satellite communications and everything? Or can we find a cheaper network maybe based on something that's already there? And, you know, I'm making some of this up as we go, but is there a cell phone solution? Is there a uh, global Wi-Fi solution with some of the commercial providers that are moving out to do global Wi-Fi from space. How can we do this in a way that is cost effective for the American taxpayer while we're there, but also systems that uh, our coalition partners, particularly coalition partners that don't have a highly developed Air Force, can afford to acquire, can afford to operate, and can train their people to operate. I, I have one uh, question. Uh, but strike, does that extend to strike? Would you like to have a long-range strike asset that's cheap that you can expend? Well, so the question is, what is low-cost enough to make a low-cost expendable weapon cost-effective? You said five million, that's too high a price point. You know, how many of those can I afford to use, and particularly in this environment? So as we work through low-cost expendable things, I'm really interested in it, but we got to think about how would we build it different. So instead of building a jet engine to last 8,000 hours, how about if it only needed to last 25 hours? Right. Would I build it different? Would I maybe uh, 3D print the parts? Would I put it together and accept that, hey, some percentage of them aren't going to work when I come out of the box, but that's okay because none of them are coming back anyway? And how would I think about that differently? So I think we we can't afford to make those exquisite tools. We'll have to find a way to mass produce. Chief's uh, number one priority is the b battle domain awareness, bringing fifth generation, fourth generation, everybody together as a force multiplier. That's been true throughout history. What are some of the experiments you guys are doing? Are you satisfied with where you're going, especially the combat cloud? because you have a lot of single-seat aircraft. You know, you benefited from a twin-seat aircraft in the E when you flew it, but there is a task saturation question there and information, the importance of information. Talk to us a little bit about the experimentation you guys are doing to wrap your heads around how best to use such a battle network. So coming out of our Air Superiority 2030 study that we did two years ago, part of what came out of it was not just about platforms, it was about, so what are we going to need in the future to be able to communicate and to find those targets? So we did two experimentation campaigns we started. One we called Data to Decision, which is looking at what you just talked about. How can you take the reams of data that are provided by our own exquisite capabilities, by commercially available capabilities, and then by the publicly available capabilities that are out there on everybody's cell phone, taking a picture, uh, you know, selfies in front of things, and how can you bring that together, fuse it with some kind of algorithm, sort through it, and then either raise a flag that says, hey, some human come look at this, I think you might care about it, or push it out to the people that are forward to support their decisions. The second part we call defeating agile, intelligent targets. So we know we've got to find mobile targets. Peer adversaries are going to make them hard to find, things like ballistic missile uh, launchers is kind of the classic case. But they're going to move beyond that and not just make them mobile, but do things to camouflage them, things to create alternative decoys, and how will we work to do that? So we've been working on that for a couple of years to bring that forward, and we'll continue to experiment. Uh, General Saltzman uh, is had task from the chief to do kind of a follow-up to Air Superiority 2030, which is about multi-domain command and control, and the focus there is, okay, how will we go that next step now? We've done some experiments. What's ready? How will we bring those things into our air operations centers? General Harigian talked here yesterday in a great talk about some Pathfinder efforts he's doing in his air operations center to do a dynamic targeting tool that helps him work through the decisions and the information required to do things fast. And so we have some things going. We think they'll be based on kind of an open architecture so that we can ask every vendor here to come have an idea and plug it in and we can use it instead of having somebody's proprietary architecture. Uh, it'll be uh, based on rapid updates, so an agile software update. So instead of waiting three years for a new complete you know, update, that you'll get an update every few months, kind of like a Apple does or like Tesla does, and try to, work, try to work to do that. General Mobile Holmes, Commander of the Air Combat Command, sir, thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And, and to clarify, the $5 million airplane, I was thinking, could be 
reusable but expendable okay. if necessary. And I, okay. I should have I should have prefaced that. Sir, All thanks right. so much again. Thank you.